the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Fletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? So, Mark, what the hell's going on this week? Well, what the hell's going on is we're asking you guys to subscribe to the podcast. If you like what you're hearing and you're enjoying these episodes, uh, we ask you to go wherever you're listening on uh, Stitcher or Apple. We're on all of them, I think. We are. And so wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe and also tell your friends and rate us if you like us. Don't rate us if you don't like us. (laughs) And uh, spread the word. We're having a lot of fun making these podcasts, and we hope you're enjoying listening to them. So, is there a what the hell's going on this week, or is it just oh, about subscribers? It's just about subscribers. <laughs> oh, okay. Bye, everybody. No. <laughs> What are we talking about? We are talking about the coronavirus and particularly the role of authoritarian regimes in public health security through their handling of this. And so it's a really fascinating piece in the Wall Street Journal weekend section by your friend Yaroslav Trofimov comparing the Chinese response to the coronavirus with here is experience as a 16-year-old boy in Kiev during the Chernobyl crisis and all of his experiences, how the regime lied, how they were more afraid of the regime than they were of the radioactive dust until it became clear that the radioactive dust was coming and then they became more afraid of the dust than they were of the regime and that was a problem for the regime. And there was a really fascinating HBO series recently called Chernobyl. It was real, very popular it's as really, well. So. It's really well done. Yeah. Uh, and there's a scene there where the uh, officials are talking about how a nuclear reactor can't melt down. And they're reporting to Gorbachev in a Politburo meeting that everything's under control. And, uh, small fire. It was just a small fire. Exactly. We're going to play a little clip of that. Comrade General Secretary, I can assure you that Professor Legazov is mistaken. Bukhana reports that the reactor core is intact. And as for the radiation... Yes, 3.6 Rontgen, which, by the way, is not the equivalent of one chest X-ray, but rather 400 chest X-rays. I think the true number is much, much higher. If I'm right, this fireman was holding the equivalent of 4 million chest X-rays in his hand. Professor Legasov, there's no place for alarmist hysteria. It's not alarmist if it's a fact. Well, I don't hear any facts at all. All I hear is a man I don't know engaging in conjecture, in direct contradiction to what has been reported by party officials. So, you know, it's fascinating because there's two problems with authoritarian regimes in dealing with these kinds, whether it's a public health crisis like a a virus or a crisis with a Soviet-made nuclear reactor melting down. One, there's the problem of lying to the world. They lie to us and they don't share information. They don't tell people so they can take containment measures. But two, they lie to themselves. You know, there's a, there's a phrase called authoritarian blindness, that the regime, that people at the top of the regime don't get information because the, the system is, creates such fear that people are afraid to report bad news up the chain. And so they're already inefficient because they're totalitarian and they're already prone to lying. But then they get lied to because they created this authoritarian system that then provides them with bad information so they can't even respond to the crisis. So you remind me, one of the things, this is what you get for listening to two moderately old people talking (laughs) talking about the Soviet (laughs) Union. It reminds me... Moderate in my case. (laughs) Right, yeah. Mark's slightly younger than me. But one of the things about the Soviet Union was that people got around, you know, direct commentary about the regime by telling jokes. And uh, I remember one uh, one joke that sounds exactly like what you just talked about, you know, where uh, Stalin's giving a speech to, you know, whatever it is, or, uh, to the Comintern, and, uh, and somebody sneezes while he's talking. And he stops speaking, and he looks in th- at the room, and he says, who sneezed? And there's silence. And he says, no, 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 I mean it. Who sneezed? And still... There's silence because, you know, you you interrupted (laughs) the general secretary of the Communist Party and our very scary leader. She says to the first row, stand up. They stand up and he says, was it one of you? There's silence. And he goes, I'm going to have every row stand up. And if nobody admits it, I'm going to start shooting. And so man gathers up his courage, stands up in the fourth row and says, Comrade Stalin, it was me. It was me. I sneezed. I'm so sorry. Don looks at him and says, oh, bless you, and keeps talking. (laughs) But this sort of encapsulates, if anybody's seen the film The Death of Stalin, this is sort of people, people become afraid of 
bad news. They become yeah. afraid of information. And of course, this is hugely relevant, not just when you talk about Chernobyl and the former Soviet Union, but when you talk about the coronavirus and you talk about the Chinese Communist Party. Comrade Xi has mismanaged this challenge hugely, letting the, the disease spiral out of control because he wanted to suppress information out of it, about it. But in fact, if you go through the news, all you find is every single authoritarian, totalitarian government is lying. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, Ronald Reagan always used to joke, say, I can't pass up a chance to tell a joke, so I'm going to digress because like, there was a gr another great Soviet joke like that that illustrates the point. Brezhnev goes out on the balcony of, of the Kremlin at dawn, and the sun is rising, and he says, good morning, sun. And the sun says, good morning, glorious leader Brezhnev of the Soviet people, proud leader of the proletariat. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And Brezhnev goes back into the Kremlin. At the end of the day, he walks out at dusk, and he sees the sun setting, and he says, good evening, sun. And the sun says, fuck you, I'm in the West. Donald Reagan <laughs> used that kind of language, Mark Tyson. We have an explicit rating for a reason. <laughs> I'm going to live it. I'm going to use it. <laughs> so, I, I, living, but the, but the, living up the old days. the point is, nobody wants to tell Brezhnev or Xi or, you know, any of these Or people. Ayatollah Khome Khamenei or, or, Ayatollah or Khamenei. Kim Jong-un. You know, what they really want to say is, fuck you, I'm in the West. Or, you know, fuck you, there's a coronavirus. <laughs> you know, we need help. And they're afraid to do it. There's a terrific piece in The Atlantic about this authoritarian blindness. And uh, the author points out that in 1958, there were all these reports after Mao Zedong about record grain and peanut and, and wheat production happening to the point that Chairman Mao actually advised people to eat five meals a day and they were pouring out the leftovers into the river because there was so much food and it was precipitating. In fact, there was not record numbers. It was the largest, it became the largest famine in human history, it killed tens and tens of millions of people because nobody wanted to tell Chairman Mao that actually, no, your agricultural policies are actually failing Destroy, failing and destroying the country and the so, propaganda behind and, it is a lie yeah. no i mean look this is the challenge and you know you and i you and i are going to talk about this with yaroslav but i do think that it provides the american people with a different perspective on the threat that authoritarian and totalitarian governments pose to our country which is it's not just that they support terrorists or they have illegal nuclear weapons programs that we can argue about till the cows come home. It is that in the very way that they handle a public health emergency, they are lying and they are perpetuating it and they are spreading disease. You know, that image that I'm betting almost everybody who's paying attention has seen of the deputy health minister of Iran giving a press conference in which he, you know, was reassuring everybody as he wipes sweat from his forehead, only to, of course, be revealed the next day to have come down with the Wuhan virus himself. You know, this is this epitomizes the, the challenge that these guys pose to us. But it also shows how, like, people within the regimes actually buy the propaganda. Right. But the problem problem for us here is that this is also a crystal ball for us because, okay, you know, the Wuhan virus only affects the young and the elderly and the infirm. We understand that. Most people who get it only have the sniffles. They may have a slight fever, but they're not going to die. On the other hand, there are other diseases that have cropped up, whether it was Ebola or even HIV AIDS, where, you know, if it is something of that lethality, you are looking at such unbelievable risk that is posed to us by these lying, vile governments who would rather see people die than cured. Yeah, well, first of all, we don't know yet how lethal and how serious this virus could be, that, they, that this could peter out as the weather gets better and as we can do, succeed in containing it, or it could get a lot worse. We'd need to be careful. But you're right. I mean, it could the next time it could be something far worse, far deadlier, and uh, it, it's a problem. You know, we have, there was a lot of people who criticized George W. Bush for his focus on democracy. And, so, and, and one of the reasons why he was so focused on advancing democracy, especially in the Middle East, is that people who live in free societies have an outlet for their grievances and they're, not, they're less prone to, to radical ideologies. And I agree with that. But here's the, here's the thing is that, you know, we're living in a global, you know, whether you believe in globalization or concerned about globalization, we are in a global economy. We're on a global world. People travel more, people communicate more, people trade more. And 
what happens 3,000 miles away. We found on September, on September 11, 2001, what happens 3,000 miles away can affect us here at home. And it's the same thing with, with public health. It's the same thing with a lot of things. And right. But one thing that's really important is don't lie to yourself that somehow if we build a higher wall or we let in fewer immigrants or we stop all airplane travel into the country, that that somehow works. Remember, the bubonic plague, you know, the Black Death spread before there were trains, before <laughs> before there were Chinese tourists, for you know, before, before there, there was were modern sanitation. Be- well, <laughs> yes, that too. But before there were planes, trains, yes. and automobiles, yes. these diseases spread. That's why it's so important to have early warning. It's why it's so important that leaders like she share the information that they are supposed to share with people who can decode and begin to look for a cure. We lost six weeks because of him. Well, I mean, and just to understand how deadly that is, it's more actually than six weeks. But I mean, this the, in early December, they found these the first people who had come down with this. And they discovered in the hospital very quickly because some medical workers got infected. That Because the key to it is, if there's a new virus, does it have human to human transmission? Right. right? Did they just get it from eating a civet, or did they get it from spreading it from person what to person? The hell is a civet? It's an it's a furry animal that Chinese people like to eat sometimes, but 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 in Wuhan. But as soon as you discover that there's human to human transmission, you realize this could become an epidemic and a pandemic if it spreads. Right. So if you get it in the first week or so and contain it then you can stop it from spreading. But if it takes five, six weeks and all of a sudden it spreads, then you can't control it. So literally, the authoritarian system in China that encouraged people to suppress information in those early days and might have suppressed the information coming up to the government in Beijing because people didn't want to report bad news up the chain, literally authoritarianism is responsible for the spread of this virus. And so... The fact that China is a repressive totalitarian regime and they're jailing a million Uyghurs, you know, and people say, well, that's too bad for the Uyghurs, but what does that have to do with me? That's the reason why there are people now, we have the first case in the United States of a coronavirus transmission from somebody who had no contact with anyone in China. Right. Community community transmission. And if this spreads in the United States, it is because of Chinese totalitarian repression. No, couldn't agree more. So we have a great guest to talk about this. And and again, Mark uh, and I both mentioned mentioned uh, the piece that he wrote for the Wall Street Journal that, that prompted us to ask him. But Yaroslav Trofimov, is, he's, a, he's a journalist. He's a, a, an award-winning author. He is the chief foreign affairs correspondent at the Wall Street Journal, which is just an amazing job. I'm completely jealous of him. But he's been a foreign correspondent for the journal since 1999, covering the Middle East and Africa and Asia. And prior to 2015, he was their bureau chief in Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's a guy with a great taste for adventure and a really fascinating history. So uh, we're delighted to have him. Yaroslav, welcome to the show. Uh, You know, as the news about the coronavirus spreads and as the virus itself spreads from country to country, we have all been struck by how badly the communist Chinese government has handled the challenge that they faced. You actually wrote a wonderful piece about this in the Wall Street Journal called From Chernobyl to the Coronavirus. Would you just share the story with our listeners? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great to be on the show. Uh, you know, when I was watching the news from China, oh, it, it really struck home because it made me think about my childhood. I was 16 years old when uh, the reactor caught fire and exploded in Chernobyl, 90 uh, miles north of my hometown of Kiev, in the capital of Ukraine. And obviously, we knew nothing about it for days. Uh, there were rumors in the school, and some of my classmates, whose parents were reasonably were connected, sort of whispered uh, during the morning break, we're all going to die, you know, that the reactor is exploded. But uh, the authorities' main preoccupation was to that the, the news shouldn't really count and nobody should, you know, disrupt the routine and the appearances. So we're all drilling for the May Day Parade, this being one of the main socialist holidays, uh, the, the, the International Solidarity of Workers. That was supposed to happen under the radioactive skies uh, with tens of thousands of children uh, participating. St- stunning. And, of course, nobody wanted to be the bearer of bad news to the Supreme Soviet that, that something cataclysmic was happening. I think the way this works in the systems, be it in China, uh, as we have seen now, or be it in the Soviet Union, people don't want to share the bad news with their own population, but the authorities, they also don't want to share the bad news with the higher-ups, because they will be held responsible regardless of if they actually 
are guilty of whatever happened. So people uh, hide and report just the good news up the stream, and, and that's sort of the built-in feature of these systems, the bad news are swept under the rug. You talked about uh, in the piece about how your grandfather urged you not to leave Kiev. You said that he feared the radiation, but nothing was more frightening than the wrath of the state. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, this was the 80s. So in the 80s, people weren't shot in the Soviet Union, uh, usually. And even the dissidents, uh, after a few years in the Gulag, could probably hope for a resettlement in the West or, or an exchange. So it wasn't a very brutal time, and you know, we didn't have that much fear. He had gone through a whole different bad experience in you know, the 1930s, the purges, where people were you know, dying for the wrong look and the wrong, the wrong word. And, and that fear, that ingrained fear of the system, sort of dominated his worldview. So uh, he had seen in his youth people being shot for, you know, showing insufficient zeal or insufficient patriotism. And to him, I was making great mistakes. So he called me and said, you know, they will never forgive you. You know, you are showing cowardice by fleeing. You should stay because you will destroy your future. Radiation, well, you know, that was less scary to him. And that's, that's, that's the way it operated in the societies. And you describe how you were lucky because or you were because you defied the authorities and sort of defied that advice you bought iodine tablets and the next day they were sold out you got on a train that was half empty and the next day people were handing babies to to strangers on the same train tracks you know as as the word spread of the of the disaster in chernobyl yeah and there was there was an information blackout in the Soviet Union, just like this one in china now which has censored the internet and you know uh, and and gives you no know, access to the twitters and the facebooks of this world but here and there, uh, there are ways around it. So we could listen to the you know, Western shortwave radios, you know, making out the news through the jammers. In China, people use the VPN. So people get the information. So we knew, I mean, those who really looked for it, like me, you know, knew what to do. So I did and, and went and, uh, and bought the iodine tablets that possibly saved my life. And then the next day we fled. And uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time uh, had a family in the eastern part of Ukraine many hundreds of miles away, and that's where we spend the rest of the spring. It's an amazing story. You know, when you talk about the getting around the news blackout, it reminds me that in China, similarly, where, you know, they have not just the Great Firewall, but intense internal surveillance and a complete government crackdown on any mention of the virus, people have gotten around it by actually referring to the virus as Chernobyl. Exactly, exactly. There were lots of comments in the in the review section where people were supposedly reviewing the TV series. So, but it's it's an old Chinese tradition. Since a lot of the censorship is automated and based on keywords, people just use slightly alternative terms that everybody understands. Uh, then this way, their comments will get purged in, on Weibo or on, uh, whatever, on, on WeChat. You, you've drawn an analogy between uh, the May Day parade that was being planned in Kiev with the reactor clouds hanging over and what happened in Wuhan province. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 sort of the obvious parallel that struck me was that in Wuhan, weeks and weeks after the virus had been identified and the authorities knew, and the authorities there knew by the end of December or the very first days of January, they still decided to go ahead with this plan to gather 40,000 families for a giant potluck dinner, in which they all shared the same table and each other's food and exchanged their infections. You know, if any of these people had known that the city is actually facing this very dangerous virus, they probably wouldn't have shot up. They would have not have been gotten sick, and many of them wouldn't have died. It was an absolutely staggering decision and an unbelievably ill-advised decision on Xi Jinping's part. I mean, you know, when we think about the demise of the Soviet Union, obviously there were there were many factors in there, but this was to the outside world. Chernobyl was such a sign of the collapse and the bankruptcy uh, of the system. I wonder what kind of an impact it's going to have on Xi. What do you think? Well, I think it's probably going to have a last one impact because we don't know to what extent the central government was aware of what was going on in the first days. And clearly, once uh, she realized uh, the gravity of the situation around January 20th, uh, everything changed. And suddenly, uh, China adopted some of the most draconian measures to stop the disease, but this in the history of mankind, probably. Uh, that didn't stop them from, at, at the same time, continuing to go after whistleblowers and reporters and people trying to spread 
and the accurate information. However, there was the, the, the strategy of containment was quite efficient. In the Soviet Union, it was a whole different situation. It was already facing severe strains, unlike China today, which is a reasonably booming economy. It's slowly down, but it's still you know, growing very fast by anybody else's standards. The Soviet Union was in decay. Uh, ethnic tensions were already bubbling up. And the whole idea was bankrupt. And so this was just the, probably the final nail in the coffin showing just how inept the system was. And at the same time, uh, as I wrote in the piece, you know, once people started getting afraid of death because of the uh, lies spread by the authorities, the fear of the authorities vanished. So, uh, so that was really the, the turning point, especially in Ukraine, where people realized that, uh, well, this government doesn't mind if we die. We shouldn't be afraid of it. There's a, you know, there's a terrific, I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but there's this wonderful uh, HBO series on Chernobyl. Yes. And, and there's this. Love it. It, it's really, it was fantastic. It was just fantastic. And there's a scene where there's a Politburo meeting taking place and everybody's telling Gorbachev that everything's fine and there's only a few people died and it's a contained fire and all the rest of it, which I, you know, I assume something similar happened in reality. Do you think that Xi Jinping before January 20th. I mean, this started in the first week of December, and it took till January 20th for Xi Jinping to really crack down on this. Do you think that people were lying up the system and that he didn't know? Well, it started in the, in early December, but I think uh, the realization of what it is happened around New Year's. And there's uh, sort of different details of when the virus was sequenced, but it's around December 30th, January 1st, January 2nd, at which point, apparently, and the Wuhan authorities told the labs to destroy the samples and to keep quiet. To what extent did he know? It's anybody's guess, but I would presume that the information flow was constrained by the authorities in Wuhan. For a while, the same happened, uh, if you remember, in 2003 during the SARS epidemic, when the authorities in Guangdong, which is you know, China's wealthiest and very important province, with its own representation in Beijing, also censored the news and filtered the news, and the, the authorities in Beijing didn't quite know for a while, what was going on. But again, it's anybody's guess who knew what when. It's, it's a very opaque system. Right. No, and I don't think we're going to have much window into it. But it does beg the question globally about how it is that we're able to fight pandemics of the kind that, that this coronavirus has evidently become. You know, I- ignorance is one thing, and there's certainly plenty of that to go around. Uh, you know, you know Italy well. I know Italy well. There's plenty of ignorance to go around in Italy on the question of health and how to fight it. But then when we look at other places that are experiencing it, we see not just ignorance, but we see more the Chinese model, which is lying to the public and hiding from the public the gravity of the risk to them. I mean, you know, how is the world supposed to work when the Irans and the North Koreas and I presume also the the Russians probably are lying about what has affected them? Well, I think it's it's a really interesting test case now because we're seeing in real life two very different systems, two different countries, Italy and Iran, experiencing an outbreak that is of comparable proportions, probably much, much larger than Iran. And you see this information coming out, often exaggerated because everybody is rushing to report more cases, and there are probably lots of false positives there. And in every region, in every minute, there's an update, and we know exactly who died where. At the same time, however, they are uh, you know, adopting pretty serious measures, isolating you know, a couple of towns, and then putting the army and the police to enforce the checkpoints. So it's also acting as a serious state. Uh, what we're seeing in Iran is actually it's the worst of, of all worlds because on one hand you have the secrecy like you have in China, but on the other hand you have the incompetence. That you have in Italy. Chinese. Italy always gets the bad rap. Uh, so I would say that the Italian state actually uh, you know, on a day-to-day level actually functions reasonably well uh, by European standards, probably better than a lot of European states that have a better reputation like Germany. But that's all different conversations. But in Iran, you see this. You see, you see ministers infecting each other, not bothering and to put on the masks. You have this complete disparity between the numbers of deaths and the numbers of infections, which suggests there is a much larger number of infections. And you have this medieval clerics insisting that you know the faithful should return to to the shrines and keep kissing the shrines because the shrines cure the diseases. You you know had this. And one of the clerics in Com yesterday protesting against plans to close the uh, one of the shrines. Compare this to the reaction by Saudi Arabia, which decided to ban religious pilgrimage for the first time, I think, in recorded history, to, to Mecca and Medina because of this. 
Oh, that's stunning. I actually hadn't heard that. Very interesting. Uh, so it's interesting because, you know, to relate this back to sort of the public policy debates here in Washington, we've had sort of a, a with the Trump presidency, a pushback on this idea that America should be promoting democracy around the world. And they said the idea is authoritarianism it, it is not our problem. People are repressing their own people. They don't have free societies. You know, that that's their problem. Let them Let them deal with it. You know, America first and all the rest of it. But doesn't this kind of an outbreak show that really authoritarianism around the world is a public health threat to America? You know, this is an example, another example of how what happens somewhere else in the world where there's a lack of freedom and a lack of transparency and a lack of a free press and free information and accountability, that that can come back and literally kill Americans here at home. Absolutely. Lies kill. Lies kill. And we have seen it in China in 2003, and no lessons were learned from that. Uh, you know, we have seen the same, the same pattern of behavior until the extent of the disease became so big that it couldn't happen anymore. Yeah, no, no, Mark makes a really interesting point, though, because I think that, you know, when we think about geopolitics and geostrategy, we really do think, I mean, again, in this political season, we see a group of Democratic candidates, most of whom largely agree with Donald Trump's foreign policy. In other words, you know, and, and would go further. They would disengage. Uh, you know, this isn't our problem. Syria is not our problem. Idlib's not our problem. We shouldn't commit military force. We should cut our military budget. And, you know, while a couple of them have talked about promoting democracy, the reality is that hasn't been a priority for the extreme left any more than it has for the I- extreme right. Right. But it does have other than geopolitical implications. And I think that the, what this has done, it, it has really highlight how damaging it can be, not just that a country like Iran sponsors terrorism or that a country like China seeks to dominate the East or South China Sea, but that they are incubators for problems that will affect us in plenty of other ways. Well, that's certainly the experience we're having now, and we're just at the beginning of it, I think. There are more countries to to come, and and it will probably test also the nature of, I mean, depending how big it gets, it will also test the nature of of our democracies. I mean, we'll see how how the populations react and and what sort of measures they will demand. I mean, there's certainly lots of irrational decision-making already. Yeah, I confess, I was happy to see that yesterday Donald Trump was asked uh, whether he had any criticism for the CDC, for the Centers for Disease Control, um, which has really been at the forefront of this. And he actually, in a rare show of control, and it said, no, they've been doing a great job and I have you know, full confidence in them. And, you know, these guys are right behind me. It was quite remarkable. But you're you're right. Uh, and, of course, was criticized for contradicting the mm-hmm. uh, health officials because, you know... To, what, with the ban on China tra- well, travel? Yeah, but, I mean, when he said that it's not a problem yet and that America's okay and, you know, we're on top of it, you know, if any other president had said that, everybody would be applauding him. But there's, like, oh, Donald Trump is not listening to the experts again. Well, don't worry. He has plenty of time to screw things up, Mark. <laughs> uh, and that, that's going to be the challenge for everybody. I mean, look at the stock market. You know, there's going to be a desire to control this, don't you think? Well, I mean, we're already seeing it in Italy, right? I mean, we're already seeing the mayor of Milan saying, oh, well, actually, let's reopen the museums and the theaters because the economy is suffering and nobody's doing anything, even though the number of infections is still growing. You know, and, uh, and we're talking about Europe, where people have free health care and sick leave. You know, imagine what's, uh, what could happen in the U.S. if and when, uh, you know, you have massive outbreaks in the U.S. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how it's going to spread. I also think there's a, a lack of understanding. Scott Gottlieb, who is a colleague of ours at AEI and was the former head of the FDA, who we had on a few weeks ago to talk about the realities of the virus and how it was being addressed, has noted that unlike other viruses that tend to diminish in virulence when the weather turns warmer, this one has actually continued to progress even as it's really up in the, already up in the 50s in, in a variety of places in Italy, like in Florence, for example, where there's a pretty big outbreak right now. Yes. And we know about this other outbreak because Italy is testing very aggressively. You know, there may be other places with the same level of infection that we just don't know about. Right. You know, in Italy, they have 600 plus cases, but more than half of them have no symptoms because Italy is actually testing people, uh, you know, in the networks of people. There's also... Right? 
reports, Yaro, that the uh, Russian uh, information trolls who were like affecting the uh, U.S. election, that there's thousands of Russian linked social media accounts have been launching what looks like a coordinated effort to spread misinformation about the virus and disrupt the effort to fight the epidemic. Uh, you know, and they're just setting rumors like this was a biological weapon started by the CIA and other sorts of things. Talk to Lewis a little bit about how authoritarian regimes like the one in Russia seek to exploit these kinds of crises. Well, it's not just the Russian trolls. I mean, people say this on Russian television openly. And this is this is one of these sort of mainline propaganda lines in Russia. And you increasingly also see it sort of underhandedly in Chinese information operations. Look, I mean, it's, it's a typical modus operandi uh, to spread conspiracy theories that make uh, the U.S. look bad. And there is always a ready market for that. People, places like Dubai or Rome, I've met who believe it. Really? Yes, yes. It's sort of somehow reached them secondhand through social media uh, and, and, and other networks. So there is always going to be a ready market that is very receptive to that. And the Russians are not going to let that market share slip away from them. It's interesting because it seems like the information age we're in is a double-edged sword in a lot of ways. Because you pointed out in your piece about how uh, it's easier to hi- for a dictatorship in the old days to hide bad news. Today, with with you know mm-hmm. the internet and everything, the information spreads. It's harder to clamp down on it. But at the same time both the information age and travel and communications and global trade, it's also a lot easier for a virus like this to spread. Right, absolutely, yes, because you have, especially out of China, you know, nobody was really traveling out of China in large numbers in 2003. Now you have millions and millions and millions uh, flying every month. You know, if you go to Moscow or, or to Venice, you will probably see more Chinese tourists than anybody else. Not right now, but until, uh, until January. So, and China in particular is, Still, you know, the world's biggest interface between, you know, wild animals and humans, and because that's where most of the, you know, slaughtering, consumption, and kind of mixing of fluids between humans and wild wild animals is, is happening. And, and that's actually a very interesting issue because China now says it will ban it. Uh, China banned it after so the SARS epidemic. Oh, they they but banned wet important. markets after SARS as well. Yes, yes, yes. They, they banned uh, these markets after SARS. They banned the consumption of civet. But, uh, you know, in China, it's a very important cultural uh, thing. It's, some people compare it to gun ownership in America. You know, it's a very Chinese <laughs> thing. To be You're going to take then. my civet out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> exactly. That is exactly what happened. Yeah. And so there was a lot of pressure to restore that industry, which is a huge industry. And the authorities escaped, you know, a year or two after SARS, they sure escaped. So let's not forget this a very important political, cultural element of that. So exit question for us. And I know from your Instagram feed, you travel probably more than pretty much anybody I know. Not as much to the United States, but between Europe and and Eastern Europe and Asia and the Middle East. What are you seeing as you travel around? It has really struck me that despite the sort of rising hysteria that we're seeing here in Washington among officials, but also I would say just in the public, that People are still traveling. People are still getting on planes and flying from place to place to place, except China. Uh, what are you seeing, and how do you think this ends, uh, you know, if you had to sum up the impact? Well, I think that as long as this was seen as a China problem, people were still getting on planes and traveling. People would put on masks maybe on a plane, but it was a reasonably normal. I think we are entering a whole new period this week because all of a sudden the list of countries where you cannot go or whose citizens cannot travel is expanding dramatically. There was a plane full of Italians that, uh, you know, was going to Israel, and they were forced to land in the military base near a lot, and then was, all the Italians were sent back, and all the Israelis were put into quarantine. And, so, you know, if you're an Italian citizen, you can no longer visit a whole bunch of countries from the Seychelles to Turkmenistan to Saudi Arabia. And, and I think the sort of list of restrictions is going to grow, and I think there will be a major disruption in travel overall in the next few weeks. And I, yeah, so I think that's sort of the reasonable thing to do now is to assume that whenever you go to a foreign country, you might be stuck for two weeks or more. Well, that sounds actually appealing to me right now here in Washington, D.C., <laughs> in the middle of election it depends season. depends on whether you're stuck in Florence or Wuhan. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but 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 I think you know. Look, if, uh, at the end of the day, one of the most fascinating things is going to be just what the you know afterwards when we do the reckoning, what the impact is going to be on the Xi Jinping government, what the impact is going to be on efforts to disengage the global economy from the Chinese economy, which have been certainly advocated by some here in in Washington and elsewhere. It is going to be an interesting year indeed for all of us. Well, I think I think it's going to be interesting to watch what's going to be the impact on the U.S. government because there are two ways it can go. It will probably go two ways. You know, on one hand, the argument will be that it was all brought by foreigners, so you know, let's build a bigger wall. And on the other hand, the argument will be, well, people are dying because we have the universal health care, and uh, and that's why we have an outbreak. And that will probably be how the debate will shape up. Right. We talk about Russian trolls and the Russian government weaponizing this virus to use in their information wars. Mm -hmm. But you're exactly right. And we're seeing it already. This is an election year and there is absolutely nothing beyond the pale for people to weaponize in their effort to boost their favored political candidate. There's going to be another debate coming soon. And unlike the last one, when we waited 80 minutes for Wuhan, the Wuhan virus to be brought up, my guess is it'll be front and center. Absolutely. Yes. Well, I mean, I think it has now gone all everywhere. So we we shall see. We shall see. Thank you so much for taking the time, and it's always no, such no a pleasure worries. to talk to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So one of the most fascinating things that to me came out of this discussion is whether or not this virus has the potential to put leaders like Xi Jinping at risk. What do you think? So there's this great article in The Atlantic by Zeynep Tefeci, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And the author makes the point that in China, actually, before she, they were starting to have a little bit of this idea that you could you report in corruption. You could come to the, to the regime and talk about these things. And she has actually clamped down on that and created a, you know, sort of going back to traditional one-man rule and cult of personality. He's trying to turn himself into a new Mao. So actually, China is in the opposite situation that the Soviet Union was under Gorbachev, where in Gorbachev, things were loosening up and people were were speaking out a little bit more and there was glasnost and perestroika. In China, it's the opposite. You're having sort of a return to repression, return to one-man rule, return to even greater. It had been moving towards authoritarianism. Now it's moving sort of back to totalitarianism in a lot of ways. So it'll be interesting whether how that affects whether the regime can withstand the blowback from the people over its mishandling of this. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a lesson to us as well, potentially, about how to erode confidence in leaders like that. Unfortunately, I don't think either Donald Trump or whoever the Democratic candidate to be president will be are going to be willing to prioritize using information in this way against those sort of regimes, whether it's Putin or Kim Jong-un or Xi or, or, or Ayatollah Khamenei, although I did see that Mike Pompeo has been pretty aggressive in condemning the Iranians on how they're handling the coronavirus. Coronavirus. Sure. But, you know, for all of us, I mean, we really haven't confronted something like this in our lifetime. SARS didn't really have the same impact here in the United States as it did across Well, because Asia. the economy was different. So, like, people, as, as Yaro was pointing out, that people didn't travel as much to China in 2003 as they do today. We didn't have the economic integration with China and the supply chains uh, and the investment uh, in China that we do today. And it's interesting because because of the trade war. There's been sort of this movement to disengage from China, from people, companies moving there because of the trade war, moving their supply chains out of China. And I wonder if this is going to accelerate that. Well, I mean, that no, I asked that, exactly that question. But it's not just because of the trade war. It's also because of China's you know, malign um, manipulation of the global trading rules of the road that countries have, that countries, that companies, that individuals are, you know, asking themselves whether it's really where they want to lock up their dollars. This is only going to make it worse for China. And I don't think anybody in their right mind can think to themselves, wow, I need to have all my eggs in the Chinese basket in the future. I think a lot of Americans don't realize how integrated we are and dependent we've become on China for supply. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, I mean, my kids play ice hockey, and we just got a note from our coach saying, FYI, if you need hockey sticks, you probably should buy them now because a lot of them are being made in China and the supply chains are getting disrupted. Wow. And just in the uh, this morning, I was listening on the news that we're, there actually might be a shortage of diet soda because yes, Splenda, yes. Splenda is made in China. Yeah, no, I saw that. Diet Coke may be impacted as well. And so, you know, people are going to start seeing 
that uh, this is affecting our daily lives, not just as a public health threat, but just as an economic threat, too. Right. Well, I hope that what it does is it causes a rethink about the nature of foreign governments, the impact that it has on us economically. You know, have you seen all the pictures of, of shelves, for example, in Italy that have been absolutely denuded of basic goods, toilet paper, you know, all uh, masks are now uh, absolutely unattainable um, in most places. I was at a CVS in downtown Washington, D.C. looking for something else, but I saw that there was a big hole on the shelf where their masks had been. Yep. You know, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of alarmism that shouldn't be there. But there's also a lot that we are learning right now. And I hope that we are able to translate what we're learning and actually take some warnings from it and adjust our foreign policy accordingly. And frankly, frankly take advantage of this strategically. I mean, this, the reality is, is that China is the biggest national security threat to the United States going into the 21st century. This is a country that has been rising economically, rising in military power, and you know the country that we're probably most likely to stumble into a war with in the next 50 years is China, as they become more powerful and more, more military power um, and are less deferential to America. If you're an American business right now and you're looking at China and you're looking, you're looking to put your supply chain somewhere and you say, look, they're stealing intellectual property. We're in a trade war with them over, over all this stuff. They, you know, they're arresting, they're, they are arresting people and throwing them in prison and running concentration camps. Yes. Their mishandling of this virus has now disrupted your supply chains where you can't get your products out of China and you're losing millions of dollars if you do, uh, do that. Why would any sane person put their supply chain in China? Because of cheap labor? Here's the exit point. Okay. If you looked around the world and you are old enough and you looked around the world and you said to yourself, gee, maybe an empire like the Soviet empire shouldn't really be building and controlling nuclear plants because they don't know how to build them and they don't know how to run them. And when there's an accident, they lie about them. Yeah. If you said that to yourself, maybe today you should be saying to yourself, maybe we shouldn't allow countries like Xi Jinping's China or Russia or North Korea to have so much control over their population that they can lie to the world about a disease that could have an unbelievably destabilizing effect on the world economy, not to speak of the number of people it's going to kill. Just ask yourself that question and then say, what should we do? I agree. So with that, another episode is done. Let us know if you want to hear anything specific from us, if you want us to talk to anybody specific, if you really wish that we had done something differently. No, don't tell us that. We are absolutely impervious to criticism. <laughs> you can just send that to Alexa. Unlike Chinese, unlike Chinese Un communists. Unlike the Chinese communists. <laughs> We want we want you to send negative information up uh, up the chain to uh, to to Alexa to, to Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Take care. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Weinset, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI dot org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D Pletka, and I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.